He's an on time God. Yes, he is. He's an on time God. Yes, he is. He may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. He's an on time God. Yes, he is. He's an on time God. Yes, he is.
that whatever situation, God, you bring joy in the morning, that all of our hope, God, is in you. All of our peace, God, is in you. So, God, today we serve you and only you, God. And we give you honor, God. We give you praise, God, that when we call on the name of Jesus, that you turn situations around, God. I'm praying, God, come and turn this thing around. And God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. Calling on the name It changes everything God turn it around God turn it around God turn it around And all of my hope Is in the name The name of Jesus
turning around. God's turning around. declaration this morning that all of your hope it's not in man it's not in this world it's not in flesh but it's in the name of Jesus and all of my hope is in the name the name of Jesus Breakthrough will come, come in the name, the name of Jesus. One more time. All of my hope is in the name, the name of Jesus. Breakthrough will come, come in the name, the name of Jesus. You want to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Don't you just love the Lord? What He can do and what He does. Isaiah chapter 40, I want to read a few verses. Some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with these verses. It's at the end of the chapter. We'll begin with verse 28. Isaiah is writing here, and he asked this question, a couple of questions. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, 
neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might. He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young man shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I want to preach to you today on this topic, On Time God. Somebody say, yes, he is. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day and for your spirit and for your touch and for what you've already done here today, Lord. I believe you've already healed and you've already moved and you've already done great and mighty things. And Lord, I pray that you encourage us through your word now, Lord, that you would touch us through your word, Lord, that you would help us to be closer to you through your word, Lord. I need your anointing to preach, but not just me, but others that are here, Lord. They need a touch from you as well. And God, I pray that you move in our lives today, Lord. Touch us in all aspects. Speak into our heart today, Lord. And God, we surrender to you. And I pray that you move and touch in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Why don't you turn around and greet three or four or five people. Tell them you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Aren't you glad that you're here? I'm glad that you're here. Glad that you're Decided to come and be with us. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. You know, timing is everything. Did you know that? That the success of something often is related to when it happens or when something around it happens. You know, you have to kind of be in the right place at the right time. I think lots of times of things in my life and I'm not talking just spiritually speaking, but things I enjoy doing. Like, for example, I enjoy going deer hunting, and I have found out that I'm not a very good hunter, that I just have to be in the right place at the right time for something to happen, right? It's just, it's not on me. It's just the timing has to be right. I guess that's the same way for some of you who maybe not doesn't go hunting, but maybe you go shopping, you know, and you just walk in and the sale just started or the, what is that Kmart used to have, the blue light special, you know, that thing you needed just so happened that the blue light was on, but that was just perfect timing, right? Some of you don't remember that, I guess, or too embarrassed to admit it. But sometimes it just, everything has to line up, right, for it to happen. Like, for example, if you go fishing, you've got to put the bait right in front of the fish's mouth at the right time for them to, to take the bait and to, to get hooked. We experienced that yesterday. Us guys, we did our men outing yesterday and went fishing. And, of course, you know me, I'm going to have to, you know, brag a little bit, not on me, but on some of these others. And so we caught some fish. See? Yeah. Yeah, we, we caught some fish. Isaiah caught that. He caught several. Uh, and there's Andrew. He caught, caught a big one. And, and uh, Richmond caught one or two or four. Um, Cam. So we had all kinds of people catching fish. Look at, look at that. And that's a haul right there now. Even Josh caught a fish. Look at that. Danny caught a goldfish, you know. I was looking in its mouth to see if he's going to pay his tithe from it, you know. I was like, is there any money in that thing? What's, what's going on with that? Scott called one. Danny had, or uh, David had a few. Wilbur, we, we, all, we all caught some. There's, there's my daddy-in-law. He was happy. So we all, Earl caught some. We all caught some fish, I believe. So it was, it was great. We ended up probably catching, I don't know, 50, 60. I don't know how many fish we caught. Somebody told me this morning they thought we caught 100, but I don't. I don't know if we caught that many, but we caught a lot. It was, it was fun. And uh, we had a good time. And, yes, I did catch a fish. And, yes, I do have a picture. <laughs> right? As a matter of fact, I caught five fish. Right? And Memphis helped, or uh, Jackson, rather, helped me get one in. So that was, that was good. He didn't fall in. That was what my concern was. The, the funniest part was he and I was fishing up kind of by ourselves. And he said, man, my mommy's going to kill me. I got mud all over me. <laughs> I said, I'd be all right. Blame it on your daddy. So, but sometimes timing just has to be right for things to happen. And I want you to know that God is an on-time 
God. His timing is impeccable. It's flawless. It's spotless. It's flawless. It's perfect. Just look through the Bible of all the things that God does and all the things that he did, and you can see the timing of God is always perfect. I think of you know, Moses and the children of Israel going to the Red Sea, and just when they lost hope, the seas parted, and they walked across on dry land. Or I think about them going up the city of, to, of Jericho, and they're marching around, and just like God told them on the seventh time, when they marched around, the walls came tumbling down. Or when the three Hebrew boys, about the time they threw them in the fiery furnace, a fourth man showed up and protected them and watched over them. Why? Because his timing is perfect. It it's just not a coincidence that when they put Daniel in the lion's den, those lions just weren't hungry all of a sudden because the Bible says God shut their mouths and kept them from eating Daniel up because God's timing is perfect. Joseph gets sold into slavery by his brothers. He ends up, long story short, in Egypt because God needed somebody in Egypt at that time, and so his timing is perfect. I think of Esther. She was queen at just the right time. As a matter of fact, Mordecai said, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Because God has great timing. He has on time timing. And when the God is always up to something, but the hard part is for us is that we don't like to wait on God's timing. We live in a time where everything is at our fingertips available all the time. We live in what I call a microwavable world. Everything is quick. Everything is instant. Everything is, you know, right now. And we want it instant. We have instant coffee. We have instant oatmeal. We have instant mashed potatoes. We have instant everything, right? Because we want it immediately. We want it instantly. Uh, I heard a story this week of a, of a guy who had grown up in a poor village in Africa. And he came to the United States and he was shocked at all the incident that America had. You know, in his country, you had to plant your vegetables and you had to let them grow and take time and mature. And then you had to go out and harvest your vegetables and bring them in. And then you had to get them ready and prepared. And he didn't know you could just go to the store and buy a can of green beans. You know, it was to him, that was instant. And so the same thing when it come to meat, you know, in their country, they had to go out and catch fish and bring them in and, 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 you know, get the meat ready. Or they had to raise animals and then kill them. And he didn't know you could just go to the butcher. Everything was instant. You know, he'd go to the store and he would see instant coffee and he would see instant oatmeal and he would see instant potatoes. And he was just fascinated. But he said, I drew the line when I went down the aisle and it said instant baby formula. Mm -hmm. No, he said. It'll take some of you a minute to, to get that. I thought it was funny. Don't have to, I mean, you want me to explain it? I mean, anyway, I thought it was good. Maybe the delivery wasn't as good as it should have been. The joke was good, the delivery one. So God is a God that, first of all, he shows up at the nick of time. We can see that in the story of Jonah, right? He's on the ship, and many of you know the, the story of Jonah. He's on the ship, and he's running away from the Lord. He's, he's heading to the wrong place. He's supposed to go to Nineveh, and he's heading somewhere else. And so they take him, the storm's raging. They take him and throw him out, and the Bible says that the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah because God shows up at the nick of time. I think of Abraham and Isaac. Abraham is taking Isaac up to the mount to sacrifice him because God told him to sacrifice his only son. And Abraham and Isaac is, you know, they're at the bottom of the hill and they're getting all the stuff together. They're getting all the wood together. They're getting all the, the, the supplies together and they're getting ready to go up the mountain. And Isaac says, I see the wood and I see the fire and I see all that you've got here, Dad, but where is the sacrifice? And Abraham says, the Lord will provide. And so they begin to go up this side of, uh, of the mountain. And as they're going up this side of the mountain, what they don't know is over here on this side of the mountain, there's a ram that's coming up the mountain. 
And so they're making their way up, and Abraham's probably thinking, how am I going to come up with a, you know, what am I going to do here? How am I going to tell him that he's the sacrifice? How am I going to, to tell him that he's the one that I'm supposed to sacrifice? How is this all going to play out? But what Abraham didn't know was God was already showing up. He had a ram going up the other side, and the ram got caught in the thicket. For whatever reason, God made that ram think, boy, that looks like something good to eat on that side. And so he sticks his head in there and gets caught and there he is and so when Abraham gets to the place that he's going to make the sacrifice when they get to the altar when they get to the place of sacrifice and he raises his knife to get ready to kill his only son the Lord stops him and gives for him instead a substitute sacrifice God was already there showed up at the nick of time and saved Isaac from slaughter because he already provided a sacrifice in a ram that was already there and it just goes the same way with us when man was in his sin when man had no way of saving himself when man was down deep in the miry clay and in the horrible pit when man couldn't do anything to bring salvation upon himself and man was headed to the place of sacrifice what man didn't know it was that down through history God all already had a man and his name was Jesus and he was coming up this side of history he was walking up this side of history and he was heading to the cross and when man got to the place of sacrifice when man got to the place that he couldn't save himself and he knew he was going to die what he didn't know was Jesus the Lamb of God was already provided God showed up in the nick of time and Jesus died on the cross so when man got to the place of the altar he looks and Jesus is already there the substitute lamb the sacrifice for our sins God shows up in the nick of time aren't you glad that he has a you serve a God that is an on time God that shows up when we need him to I can think about my salvation this coming week Wednesday April the 24th is my birthday I'll be 29 years old. Do I, don't I look 29? You say, you don't look a day over 28. 29 years. This coming Wednesday, I've been saved. 29 years. Praise the Lord for that. God saved me. And I felt like when I was at church that night, it was my last chance. I'm not going to go into all the details. I'm just here to tell you. It was, I felt like it was my last chance. As a matter of fact, I felt that if I left church that night, I wouldn't make it. I wouldn't make it through the week. I might not make it through the night. I felt like God was giving me my last chance. But he showed up in the nick of time, and he saved me. He pulled me up out of that horrible pit, out of the miry clay, set my feet on a rock. He established my goings. He knows what he had planned for me. He knew what he was going to do in my life, and so he saved me. He convicted me. He brought me up, and he gave me new life. He gave me life, eternal life. God shows up in the nick of time. God shows up at the right time. See, sometimes with God, the timing has to be just right. When he first calls his disciples, you know, he, he, he goes out on the boat and he teaches some folks. And then he brings the boat back in and, and he tells Peter to cast, his, to, to cast out a little bit and to take his nets and to cast them out. And Peter's like, we've went all night fishing. We've tried all night and we didn't catch anything. And yet you're telling me to cast my net again? Well, okay, nevertheless, he says, at your will, I'll do it. And when he did, God's timing was so right that he caught so much fish that the nets began to break. He called his partners over, which was John and James. They came over and they started helping him get the fish in the boat in so much that the Bible says that the boats begin to sink. They fished all night and caught nothing, but at the word of God, because God's timing is right, they had a massive amount of fish. And see, for salvation to happen in somebody's life, 
There must be a drawing. There must be a conviction in your life. You can't just get saved when you want to get saved. God has to beckon you. He has to call you. He has to cry out to your heart and say, now is the time. Now you need to come. Now is the time for you to come. And God's timing is always right. It's never wrong. See, God's timing is always perfect. I was talking to my mom about this just last night. That when, you know, back in 1972, some of you remember that, my mom couldn't get pregnant. And everybody around her was having babies. I mean, I've got all kinds of first cousins and third cousins, and, you know, that's like a year older than me. And she couldn't get pregnant. As a matter of fact, she went to the doctor and they told her it was impossible for her to get pregnant. She had surgery because her uterus was upside down or twisted or something. They did surgery and still they told her after surgery, it's impossible. You can't get pregnant. But she went to my, my great aunt, my dad's aunt, went to her house and they used to go there for prayer meeting. And they went and they sat down and they, they prayed and as they were praying, she began to prophesy and told my mom, the Lord's going to give you the desires of your heart. I'm going to give you the desires of your heart. But instead, she got pregnant. <laughs> so, and so, sure enough, within a short amount of time, she was pregnant with me. So when God said, or when man said it was impossible, yet God said it's very much possible and my timing is right. Now, it's not just a coincidence or happenstance that I was born when I was born. If I was born a year earlier or a little older, I might not have met my wife, who is much younger than me. She's like seven years younger than me, right? So people used to say I robbed the cradle, but now they say she robbed the grave. <laughs> but the timing on that might have been different, right? I mean, if I was a year older, we might have been, eight years might have been too much. I don't know, but God knows. God knew he had a purpose. God knew he had a plan. He knew it then. He knows it now. He's not going to change, and he shows up right on time all the time. He was right on time with the birth of Jesus. The Bible says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. He was right on time when it come to the birth of his son. Not a year early, not a month late, not a moment off. He was right on time. Time. He was right on time with his death. Many times you read in scriptures where Jesus would say, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. But then the Bible tells us in Luke chapter number 9, verse number 51, he says, and it came to pass when the time was come that he should be delivered up, that Jesus steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Why? Because the time had come for him to die on the cross. It wasn't a coincidence that he was born when he was. It wasn't a, a, by chance that he died when he died. See, it's not a coincidence that Jesus died on Passover. It wasn't by chance that he rose on the third day. It wasn't an accident that the Holy Ghost came down on the day of Pentecost. The Bible says, Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, then when they were all gathered in one accord and in one mind, that's when the Holy Spirit showed up because God always, shows up at the right time no matter what and I'm glad I serve a God amen that's an on time God he shows up in the nick of time he shows up at the right time and he shows up on time his second coming will be right on time just like his birth was right on time. Just like his death was right on time. Just like his resurrection was right on time. Just like the giving of the Holy Spirit was right on time. His second coming will be right on time as well. The Bible says that hour and that day no man knows, not the angels, not even the Son himself. But it will be right on time. Jesus says to be ready for in such an hour that you think not, the Son of Man comes. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 says this, Paul writes and he says, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. 
You may not know the time, but he'll be right on time. Peter said in Peter 3, 9, 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackless, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's coming back. It's just a matter of time. And when he comes back, it'll be a perfect on-time delivery. And he's never too late. I think of Jesus going to see Jairus and he's going to Jairus' house and the woman with the issue of blood interrupts him and starts talking to him. And I'm sure Jairus is wanting Jesus to come on. My daughter's sick. If you don't hurry, she's going to die. Come on, you don't have time to talk to this woman and deal with her problems. I've got my own problems. I was here first, as a matter of fact. So you need to come with me. But as they're talking and, and he heals the woman, as they begin to go to Jairus' house, they come to Jairus and they say, it's too late. Your daughter's already dead. Don't bother the master anymore. It's over. It's too late. But Jesus said to him, fear not. Only believe. And he goes and heals his daughter. John chapter 11, Lazarus dies. And Jesus goes. I love this story. He goes and he tells them to roll away the stone. And his sister says, surely, after four days, it's going to stink. It stink. He stinketh, the Bible says. I like the King James Version. He stinketh after four days. But yet Jesus told them to roll the stone away, so they did. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says that he that was dead came forth. See, even when he's four days late, he's still right on time because we serve a God that's never late. He's always on time. He does things right. His timing is perfect. And the hard part for us is we have to wait. And that's a hard thing for us to do is wait. The Bible says, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. These verses at the end of Isaiah chapter 40 are talking about strength and its attributes. It's talking about renewed strength and gaining new strength. It mentions the strength of an eagle's wings that lift it up high. It mentions strength that is necessary to run and not become weary. Strength to be able to walk and not faint. It talks all about strength, but for us to renew strength, for us to gain new strength, for us to mount up and to run up and to walk up, for us to do those things, something must happen first. Wait for it. We must wait. That's what we got to do. And for those that do wait upon the Lord, you get these attributes of strength. Now that word wait is the Hebrew word kava. It's easy to say. Some Hebrew words are not easy. You know, it's like you're clearing your throat. <clears throat> but this one is pretty easy. Kava. And it's got two meanings. It's got a literal meaning and it's got a figurative meaning. The literal meaning means to collect or to bind together like a cord or a rope. And the more strands on a cord, the more that a rope is twisted and woven together, then the greater the strength of the rope. It's not how long it is. That doesn't matter. What matters is the strength. Is what makes it strong is how many strands or wrapped around it, right? So you've got this cord, and the more strands that are wrapped around it, then the long or the, the stronger that it is. It has nothing to do with how long it is, it has to do with how many strands go about it. Ecclesiastes says this in chapter 4, verse 12: a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Why? Because it's bound together. Now, the literal definition of kava implies strength through numbers. The more strands in your rope, the greater its strength. This 
particular rope here is not probably too strong because it's not too thick. It's not been strand together too much. Our strength comes through being united with Christ. We're twisted, we're, we're woven, we're bound together with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the literal meaning of kava. The figurative meaning of kava is to wait to look for, to hope, to expect. It conveys an anticipation like kids on Christmas morning wanting to get down and see what's underneath the tree, wanting to, to go and see what presents they may have. And so with anticipation, they wake up bright in the morning and they go and wake their parents and say, come on, we got to go see what's underneath the tree. They're so excited. That's what Kava's figurative meaning means. And all the translations I saw for this word wait in Isaiah 40, 31 was the figurative meaning, not the literal meaning. It meant to wait. But why is that? Why did they not translate it to rope <laughs> or to bind or to, you know, pull together? Well, I think it has to do with the word right underneath there where it says they shall renew. That's the Hebrew word Kalaf. And it means to pass on or to pass through or to go by, to grow up, to change, to go from one thing to another. As if you're moving from one thing to another. As if, as if you're transitioning. As if you are uh, transitioning, changing from one thing to another. So most transitions require waiting. Most changes take time. And so the word they're renewed Put together with the word wait, kava put together with kalaf means that you have to wait to get your strength renewed. So a rope strength is about uh, the amount of strands that it's composed together. And a rope strength can remain constant no matter if the rope is being used or not. If this rope's being used, it has strength. If it's laying in my garage doing nothing, it still has strength. Doesn't change the fact that it's not being not, not strong if it's not being used. If it's not being used, it's still strong. Its strength remains constant even when it's not being used. So when a rope's not being used, what's it doing? If a rope's not being used, what's it doing? It's waiting to be used, right? And at any point in time, the owner goes and takes the rope and begins to use it, then all the strands that has put it together, that has made it strong, will come through when the time comes for it to be used. Its strength will be there when the time comes. So let me put all that together by saying this. So how exactly do we wait upon the Lord? We wait like a rope. We just wait. And we wait. And when the time comes for the Lord to move, we'll be ready. See, a rope is made up of many strands, and so is our relationship with God. It, the more strands that we weave into our relationship with the Lord, the stronger that it gives us. The more strength that we have, the stronger that you wind yourself and bind yourself and make yourself strong with the Lord, then the stronger you will be, the more strands. The more strands we weave into our relationship, the more strength that he gives us. So while we're waiting, we should be weaving while we're transitioning we should be strengthening while we're changing then we should be binding to him and you bind yourself to him you strengthen yourself in him you weave yourself in him by doing the things that you know to do which is to pray and to read your Bible and to come to church and to fellowship with one another and to pay your time
child and to, to testify of what God's done for you and to tell others about Jesus and you just continuing to weave yourself and make yourself bound to Jesus, make yourself bound to him. You twist all those strands together and the rope gets stronger and the rope gets stronger and your relationship gets stronger and your relationship gets deeper and when the time comes for the Lord to reach and take you and use you and that what you've been waiting on you're like that rope you've just been waiting but you've got strength renewed because you've weaved your relationship with the Lord and he has bound you together through his strength I like what that verse says those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I have made a translation of that. I put it in what I call the CYV version, the common Yule version. Okay? Make it where that, you know, even dummies can understand it, like myself. But this is the way I'd like to translate that. But they that have their lives bound together with the Lord, like twisted strands in a rope. They shall transition from their insufficient strength to the more powerful strength like a waiting rope. They shall rise up to meet trials as if they had wings like an eagle. They shall run through life's problems not to be weary. They shall walk through life's difficulties and not faint because they have their lives bound together with the Lord. Amen.